It's my uh, absolute pleasure today to be uh, chairing um, our small business and disability panel. Uh, it is very difficult to, uh, to, to have a small business panel and that's because these guys are busy keeping the lights on in their small business. So I'm extremely honored that you've made the time and the commitment to come here today. Um, uh, I think that you'll all be very impressed with the panel. We're going to actually start. Uh, Keegan Colville is, um, uh, was, uh, owns a franchise um, of Service Master, in, Service Master Clean, sorry, in St. John, New Brunswick. And I think, uh, Keegan, you're going to start off the panel. Lucky you. Oh, am I alive? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. First off, I'd just like to thank, um, thank the group here for the invitation to come and speak today. Um, as, as Maureen said, my name is Keegan Colville. I'm from St. John, New Brunswick, and I own a Service Master franchise in that area. Um, a little bit of information to start about St. John and really kind of some of the importance that I have with this, uh, this group and this strategy is... Um, St. John is a, is a place um, in New Brunswick you know, as a whole um, that has a high level of poverty, a uh, high level of required and needed social assistance, and especially a high level of child poverty in our city. I think we are unfortunately have the highest level of child poverty in the country. Um, so when we're talking about you know, getting meaningful and important work for people of our city, uh, it's, it's a, you know, I, I look at it as a, as a business uh, goal for myself, but also as a, as a social goal for our city to make sure that we're, we're helping everybody um, contribute and we're helping everybody get themselves out of, out of these, this poverty that we're in. So what, um, what I've been, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what we do and what, what I've done in the last couple of years, last year with uh, CCRW and then make a few comments on, on the strategy. And, and importantly, I, I met with uh, the folks at CCRW last year for the first time when they reached out to us um, to hire uh, a gentleman uh, who has become a long-term and excellent employee with us. Um, someone who I get lots of, um, lots of compliments from our, our customers. Uh, and what's really important to me is that when I look to go out and hire people, and I don't look, um, you know, I, I, I say I'm almost standardizing it, but in reality, I look for people who are driven, who are motivated, who are hardworking, and, you know, who have a goal and a mindset. And, and you find that with, with you know, a different array of people and individuals with disability that have any impediment to get to the workplace, I actually find it, um, there's a little bit more there. Um, they are very driven to be in the workplace and that's important for me. We need committed individuals uh, for our work. Um, you know, to, to move on from there, um, we, we, we are happy and we, we've done a lot of, you know, of accommodating different staff members um, who, who work for us, but as a small business person, it, it aids us so much because we realize uh, that you know, making accommodations for somebody actually helps us support all of our staff uh, in, entirely. And it makes a holistic approach for our company to say, okay, if accommodations are made here, it actually makes it easier for our company to, and our staff as a whole uh, to be able to do their jobs and work. Now, Importantly in the, in the strategy here, and I think that what, what I needed uh, when I started working uh, with the folks at CCRW uh, and, and what I think that the business community as a whole needs, um, there's two big things. That is um, education, you know, how to, how to work with uh, individuals with disability, um, how to accommodate, how to communicate with them. Um, and then we, we heard it in the last panel and, uh, and they, they talked a little bit about fear. I call it stigma, but um, you know, and educating the business community about and, and, and kind of breaking their stigma uh, on people with disabilities, or persons with disabilities, um, to make sure they understand that you know they're not, and this isn't this isn't infirm people coming to work for them. These are people who are very able and, and willing to work, and that they just you know they might just have some level of impediment to just get their foot in the door. And sorry, I'm working on a little bit of piecemeal of today from notes that I've made. Um, I also, uh, just to comment a little bit on the, the last panel again, uh, I think it's very important uh, as a whole, disabled workers um, or non, um, uh, being a young person who's recently come out of the education system, uh, education definitely needs to be improved across the board for people, uh, you know, coming out of, you know, 
simply as high school education or coming out of university and colleges, there's very little supports, I believe, out there for those people. And someone who has recently made that transition from school to the workforce, uh, I know that I, I was lucky that I had people uh, and to, to help me and to guide me in those situations. But if you don't have that support network or social network uh, to be able to help you do that, uh, then, then you can be in a lot of trouble just trying to find, find yourself work and trying to find yourself a place in the, work, in the workforce. Um, and I do know as well, and, and something that was interesting in the strategy, and I did like how um, there is, uh, it's included in the, the injured workers, um, and I think that, that there is a fear there in the business community. I know there's a fear in, my, in the business community that I'm a part of, of people, and I think Don said it in the last panel, of, of people gaming the system. So to, you know, another, another stigma to break is that these aren't just people who want to, you know, come to work so they can get back off on work on another claim or things like that. There are people who are out there trying to get gainful employment, um, but it, they don't, they might not fit the, you know, the standardized uh, view that people are looking at when they're, they're originally trying to hire somebody. On a, on a, kind of a last comment um, that I think I will make here is that uh, flexibility, I think, in a lot of employers' mind can be um, very, very difficult. Um, and, and Maureen said it, you know, we're, we're all individuals who, you know, we have a lot of commitments. Uh, we have a lot of commitments to our customers. So, and, and, and our customers, you know, they'll still drop us uh, at any failure uh, on our side of the work. Um, so we, we do, you know, it is important for a small business person to be hiring people that they know can be committed and can get the work done for them because if not, you know, if, if balls get dropped, there's a lot that can be, that can be lost. Um, but it is important that we, we can do this. I've done it personally in my own organization, um, and, and I think that it's, it's, it's a very, it's, it's not a simple process by any means, but it's, a, it's an easy way, there's easy ways to get started. Um, and actually one more comment I'd like to make too, is that uh, there's another part of education that I'd like to, to bring up too, and that's, that's education um, for, for groups working with small businesses, um, such as CCRW, who are helping us um, place individuals with disabilities in our workplace, but also, bringing a level of education to the small business community of how to do that without a, a workplace agency. Um, so how do we understand that when we're, when, when we're in a hiring process or when we're going out to market with a job, how do we know to you know, be able to communicate that job properly so we're getting it from, you know, from, from people from all walks of life have the ability to apply for those jobs and how we can identify and making sure we're, we're building a culture that accepts them. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Keegan. Uh, Jamie, do you want to come next? Yeah, sure. Great. Uh, so many of you will remember Jamie Burton from last year. Jamie is the Vice President of Dolphin Digital um, and is based out of Kingston. And so thank you very much for coming today, Jamie. She's in and out only for this session. Was that you were kicking me out after this session? or? Good morning. It's a privilege to be here. Um, and I just wanted to, before I begin, say a special thank you to those of you who reached out to me this morning and uh, gave me a positive comment, um, having heard me speak before. Um, you have no idea how much I appreciated that. I am in a period of fatigue. It's the end of the year and I'm about to start vacation with my family and it's something that I look forward to and I give everything that I have to get to this point. And you are receiving me today pretty much at my lowest peak of energy. And yet when I came in here and was embraced with gratitude, I truly received that. You've given me the energy to present to you what I hope is something that lands in a place where you will understand my personal perspective, what I see as the potential for this strategy, and will give you energy to move forward with the work that you're doing. Because this is about moving forward together. This is about each other helping one another do something towards the future of disability and work. We are in the midst of the digital revolution. I know, that's got everybody going, huh? Yep, that's right, electronics, automation, AI, nanotechnology, robotics, genetics, 3D printing, and there's no part of society that is left untouched. 
It has many of us banging our heads on the wall, wondering what it is we're supposed to do to respond to this. I challenge you to understand that the time is now for us to respond. It is as if the time is smacking us in the face to making us come to attention to have proactive engagement, to act in anticipation of, to have run interference of what we've learned from the past, but looking towards totally different perspectives and opportunity. We are, with this strategy, looking to open the door to dialogue. We are talking about mutual problem solving. We are talking about deep societal collaboration. That is what is before us. And it requires us to have a change of perspective. Now, if you look at this picture, we have someone shouting boat from a remote island where they were clearly anticipating help, hoping for help, needing help. And we have someone from a boat calling land because their perspective was they'd been in the water and they wanted a secure place. Probably they were hoping for some food. So what happens when two totally different perspectives clash? in a moment that is actually mirroring each other and very the same. It is about understanding that our perspectives must change from the current perspective of the known, the expected, the learned, and put a focus on innovation and consideration of the future perspective and the talent and business essentials. There is an emerging skills market from traditional employment to the on-demand employment of the gig economy alongside the sharing economy with blockchain optimization, which is peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, skills become the marketable commodity. 89% of jobs created in Canada between October 2015 and 16 were in the category of part-time jobs. 20% of the Canadian labour force is either self-employed or in the temporary employee category. The World Economic Forum has recently put out a report that states that 65% of our children currently entering school will have jobs that do not yet exist for which they will not be trained in the skills that will be required to do those jobs. This will exacerbate the skills shortage and the unemployment in the future. Wait a second, don't go back to the picture of the person banging their head. Because this is about a moment of opportunity. This is about transitioning from that perspective where we have no idea and landing in a place where we see our opportunity. We want you. Workers will find it essential to adapt quickly enhance their skill set continually, and meet the needs of the labor market on an ongoing basis. They will have to do lifelong upskilling, reskilling. It will be essential for the worker to continue to have marketable skills. And who have I just described? Persons with disabilities constantly rebound, adapt, Think outside the box, figure things out, respond to demand, because they have to. Students right now in universities are being given the opportunity to have something called PLAR, which is Prior Learning Assessment and Recognition. This is based on previous skills and experience. And competency-based education is going to allow students to leverage existing knowledge and skills to their credits and learn only the pieces that they still need to learn. So, we are opening a door to dialogue between academics and business and agencies. This is an opportunity to look at the projection of skills, to see what are the opportunities for the future.
A perfect example of this is Shopify, Tulip Retail, where it might be that it's considered a tech firm, and yet they have a deep appreciation for the multitude and facet, all facets of skills that are required to do any job. The self-employed are some people that we can learn from in a lived, learned experience. My good friend, Mitch Brogan, was one of the first people to bring an exoskeleton therapy to Canada. Since then, the therapies for him and for others have developed into opportunities not only to meet the needs of those with disabilities, but for new business. So then why is it if we can order food and we can do just about anything on this device that my friend Candace has no idea when Will Trans is coming, if they're coming, where they're coming from, and when they'll be there. It makes no sense, and that's because we require business essentials and deep societal collaboration to meet the needs of the future of disability and work. We need to open the door to dialogue. We need to have mutual problem solving. It's critical that employment solutions be tailored and customized. It, it, we require a deep understanding of what the business needs are. We need to commit to the core of understanding what business is. We need contractual obligations that incorporate standards of delivery and present levels of job readiness. We need to meet the, G the needs of the job now while preparing others for the next job in line. And remembering that the scope of the employer is very deep. Just because they're finance doesn't mean they don't have facilities management, IT, sales, admin, customer service, law, we need a focus on consistent use of language, a process that does not divide, differentiate, but is exclusive by design. What if accommodations and adjustments were part of everyone's onboarding? Well, it's actually already happening. Yep, that's right. If I was to apply for a CEO's position today, I would be asked, what incentives do you need to come on? I would be offered incentives. A CEO's contract is about incentives, protection, the equipment provided for the job, and it secures the time of that person and their ability, i.e., you can't get the job if you can't demonstrate that you can do the job. And there's a contract to back it up. So if we're willing to do that for the big team, why not just do that for everyone? And then there is nothing in the process that divides us and them. It remains a focus on us. How we're going to do this is deep collaboration. There are a number of challenges in this strategy that have been identified. Our job is to ensure we don't overlook them or under support them because they are critical. The pillars are bang on. This is one of the best pieces that I have seen come out in a very long time. The collaboration that it took to design this strategy was impeccable in its makeup. It is multifaceted in its perspective and the presentation of what they have delivered is ours to carry forward. There is no doubt in my mind that this is possible. The critical pieces of the strategy are also based on pillars which are solid but they should only function in relationship each to the other. With open dialogue, mutual problem solving, we can get through this maze and discover a strategy that works. In all the years that I have been speaking, I have never before used a hockey analogy. <laughs> and I'm about to. So I hope you remember this moment. We must skate to where the puck is going, not to where it has been. 
So while I've been talking about the future of disability and work, let me be very clear. The future is now. Everybody should breathe. <laughs> Um, my, uh, uh, the next person up to, thank you so much, Jamie. The next person up to the mic is uh, Todd Peters. Uh, and Todd Peters is the owner of River City Remanufacturing. He does wood pallets. And this is from his factory floor that I was able to go and visit the other day. And Todd, take it away. <laughs> Thanks. So you <laughs> um, well, as when Albert DeMont came out to give the prayer the, yesterday, um, he said he felt like he was with his people. I kind of feel a little bit like a fish out of water here. You, you folks are also very smart, and, and uh, you guys, the, the work you guys are doing is, is incredible. Um, Keegan touched uh, on it in, in the fact that um, uh, employers need the education uh, of what we're here. And so uh, Maureen brought me here today basically just to kind of tell you the, my my story. So, um, as she said, it's River City Remanufacturing. We're located in Eli, Manitoba, which is about 20 minutes outside of uh, Winnipeg. We are a lumber manufacturer of pallet and crating parts, which we export to the U.S. to pallet and crating assemblers uh, there. Through the CCRW, we currently have one employee uh, with us. Uh, his name is Reed Jonathan. Uh, my initial contact with Reed was when his dad called and uh, to make inquiries if there was any jobs available. And at that time, my first reaction was, okay, here we go, here's a kid fresh out of high school getting his parents to do everything for him. Uh, so Reed's dad was very nice though, and so we talked and we discussed what our company did and, and what kind of job requirements uh, that we had. Um, we left it at that. And then it was a little while later, and I think a few days or so, went by and then Reed's mom, uh, Debbie, gave me a call and she wanted to arrange an interview and, and then that, at that time she spoke to me about Reed and Debbie explained to me that it was very important to have someone come to the interview with Reed as Reed lacks social skills. Uh, and he would not be able to uh, fully present his abilities to any possible employer. So I said, okay, that's a great idea and I said, come on down, have the 25 cent tour as Maureen has, uh, has done. Um, just so that he could, you know, come experience the plant and see the plant and, uh, you know, the sawdust, the noise, the, you know, the, the goings on. Um, so they came down for, their, for the interview and, and uh, now, uh, from what I understand now, and that uh, CCRW would normally be down there, but I guess Reed's parents have been very, very hands-on with, with Reed, which is phenomenal, um, in finding employment. Um, so... As I walked him around, one of the first things that I, that I told Reed and Debbie is that the work is, uh, looks easy. The, the people that I have make it look easy, but it's, it's, it's actually very, very hard work um, to accomplish your goals. Now, Reed's a big guy. I think he's, I don't know, 6'2", 6 6'3", 6 and, you know, he's a young strapping guy, 19 years old, and so I wasn't too worried about the physical aspect of it. Uh, so we continued on, and I just, and, you know, he, Debbie did all the, uh, all the talking and any questions that I asked uh, Reed was yes, no. Um, so I, I couldn't really gauge, you know, how he, how he felt about the plant or I couldn't gauge if he wanted to work at all, really. Um, so he just kind of stood there and he smirked, which, which now I know that I, I love that about Reed. Um, so Debbie spoke and said that, that you know, um, that he's not the, the normal 19-year-old boy, um, but that Reed was always on time, very dependable, and that he's not gonna be calling in sick and missing, missing work, um, his, his job performance won't suffer uh, because he's been out partying all night or you know, he's been texting his friends all night and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, so everything was going great and, and Reed's parents were very nice and Reed, Reed was nice, but I had concerns and and my concerns were, was he, was he going to be able to take directions? Um, was he, was he going to work well with, with our other staff? Were our staff going to work well with him? As nice as the guy wants to be, 
uh, still have a business to run. So we continued our conversation and then Debbie had mentioned CCRW and uh, that, that there was a 10 week subsidy that was offered to the employer. Okay, no idea what CCRW was, no idea what really what she was even saying and at that particular point I didn't really care. Um, I just needed some people on the floor. So, um, so, um, but I, I, I told him at that time that's, that's all good, but, uh, but that there's expectations that he has to, um, he has to be able to produce and, um, and, and that was that. Uh, so I didn't hear from them for a few days and I'd figured that maybe I'd probably scared them, uh, that, that he didn't like the plant or something, but, uh, then eventually I got a call from Jackie Joss and Jackie, uh, <clears throat> she came down to look at the plant as well and meet with me and then she explained, she was, Jackie Joss is from CCRW, um, she came down and uh, explained everything to me and read situation, etc. Um, and then now this where I'm going to be a little bit honest here is that without that read wouldn't have lasted two weeks um, and, and it wouldn't have been due to, like it wasn't, his attitude, it wasn't his work ethic, um, it, was, it was our impatience, it was, it was our lack of, of training. Um, so with that subsidy, we were able to take time with Reed and, uh, and basically allow all of us to get it right, which was, which was phenomenal. Um, we're really happy with Reed and um, we get to know him more and more all the time. He's, now he's just one of the guys. Gets, uh, gets in trouble with everybody else, and um, you know, is he my best producer? No, but he's, uh, he's definitely one of my most steady and most reliable. Um, I see my time is kind of uh, running out, so um, am I getting close here? Um, basically, Reed's parents um, have, have said that over, over the um, last couple of years that, uh, that they've seen Reed gain a wealth of maturity, self-confidence and independence and they, um, and they said that Reed's job is very important to him and, and that they assume that he, he uh, performs his job with pride, uh, which, which he does. Um, one, of the, one of the things that uh, she had said is that um, the only thing is that, that we should understand that he's always going to need some type of guidance. Um, an understanding for management, nothing significant, just merely acknowledgement and confirmation and, and apparently this was in Reed's own words, that he knows what's to be asked of him. And uh, so I said, well, let me tell you something, that's everybody, that's all my employees, they all need that. So, um, so we've reworked our training and uh, with all our new employees and we keep on, uh, we keep on working in CCR with the CCRW. Um, as we've said, one of the hardest parts is, is getting a start uh, for, for any of us. Um, and so now, throughout this conference, we've talked about uh, growing, etc. We're not a big company. We've got 30 employees. Um, we have people that move lumber. Uh, we have forklift operators and me. It's, it's not that much. So, um, so one of my mottos, though, is, is that uh, since we don't have a lot of movement up, etc., is, is make me miss you. Um, while you're here, do the best that job that you can do, um, and then once you're ready to move on, go anywhere else. Um, I will help you absolutely any way that I can. Um, Reed's coming up to his uh, two-year anniversary, and he continues to shine with us. And definitely one day, I know I'm going to miss him. I want to thank uh, everyone here for the work that you guys are doing. Uh, the education that I'm getting right now is, is unbelievable and uh, really, really resonates. Uh, thank you to Maureen and the CCRW. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you. thank you, Todd. I told Todd he's my new best friend, but don't tell Jamie or Keegan that. <laughs> Um, so next on our roster is Epo Martins. You've heard from Epo uh, for those who were in uh, with the uh, panel yesterday. Um, Epo is the uh, Director of Policy at ESDC. So take it away, Epo. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in the, uh, in the panel today. Uh, and, and just want to start by uh, acknowledging the, uh, the really great company I'm in uh, here. Uh, not only at the conference, but I think in, in particular um, the employers that I'm here with uh, on the panel. 
they really set uh, an example, uh, I think, and, and not just an example for other uh, businesses, but I think they set an example for government too, and, uh, and I think we all have a lot to learn from them. Um, so I think one of the things that's, that, that we all agree on here is, is on the benefits of, of hiring persons with disabilities and, uh, and on the business case for doing so. Um, but despite this, they, yeah, they remain really a relatively untapped uh, pool of labor. Um, uh, and, uh, and there's been a lot of discussion here over the past couple of days on, on some of the impacts uh, of that situation. Um, so I want to talk a little bit uh, about what the government is doing to support uh, employers uh, in, in terms of our uh, employment programs and our assistance programs. And then I'm, I'm hoping also that, uh, that there'll be an opportunity to, to share uh, your views and, and to provide me with your feedback as well on, uh, on, on how we're doing uh, as a government. I know I've had a chance over the last couple of days to talk to a number of people. Um, I've, I've had a lot of uh, people who've come and challenged uh, some of my views. And, uh, and I've had people who have come and brought fresh perspectives to me. Uh, and, and to me, that's, that's really invaluable, and, and that that's really has to be a big part of, of the policy development process in government. So, uh, so, so please, I really do encourage that, um, either after uh, the, the uh, panel or, or during the question period. Um, so, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we know from uh, business owners that hiring, uh, that do hire persons with disabilities, that, that that's been good for business. Um, Persons with disabilities tend to have low absenteeism, they have higher staff uh, morale, uh, lower turnover and higher productivity. Um, and they also contribute in a number of ways to, uh, to the workplace, adding an element of, of creativity um, and, and problem solving in particular. Um, I think many persons with disabilities uh, obviously face many challenges uh, in a day-to-day -day basis. And, and are therefore more creative and, and better at, at addressing some of those challenges. And that's something that they, they bring to employers. Um, and, and survey results seem to back this up. Um, not, based on one survey, 90% of, uh, of individuals uh, indicate that when they've hired persons with disabilities, they've performed, uh, they've performed at the same level or better than, uh, than employees without uh, disabilities. So the case is really is really there. Um, so, so this can uh, can result also, of course, in in the bottom line, uh, in a contrib contribution to the bottom line. And I think that was a key point that was made also uh, yesterday uh, in the employer panel, that uh, that um, that businesses will always be focused on the bottom line. Um, and, and that the case for, uh, for hiring persons with disabilities has to be made with that uh, in mind. Um, there are about uh, uh, 1.1, uh, a little over a million businesses in Canada that have fewer than 100 employees. And, uh, and research shows that there's a number of different barriers uh, that they face in hiring and retaining persons with disabilities. Uh, unfortunately, one of the big ones uh, still seems to be a bias, whether it's conscious or unconscious. Um, but there's also a number of other concerns, uh, unfounded concerns around uh, potential level of performance or productivity, um, ideas on accommodation, overestimation of the costs uh, of accommodation, um, and also a, a fear uh, unfounded of, of a potential for liability, which can act as a real deterrent to, uh, to employment. Um, there's also a lot of, uh, there's also, so, so there's quite a number of, of I think, um, uh, misperceptions when it comes to, uh, to hiring uh, persons with disabilities and also on, on how to create a, uh, an, inclusive work, uh, an inclusive workplace. Um, the, uh, so I think the best, the best way really to tackle some of these issues is, is, uh, is through education um, and to, through some of what we're doing here in terms of sharing knowledge, knowledge and, uh, and I think through the networks that are built by service organizations like CCRW and others that, um, that work to share the stories of employers and, and some of the benefits they've had. Um, but I think also there's a, there's a role that we can play uh, in, uh, in government. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, specifically through the, uh, the Opportunities Fund. 
So as, as many of you probably already know, the Opportunity Fund uh, delivers uh, or, or funds organizations that provide various employment services, whether it's um, a job search reports, work experience, uh, short-term skills development uh, activities. We also fund a, a number of employer-focused uh, activities, and these can be anything from uh, employer awareness that go directly to, to challenging those, those biases and providing, providing better and, and more accurate information uh, and knowledge on the benefits of hiring persons with disabilities, uh, but also, uh, also providing, uh, providing hands-on support to, uh, to, to prospective employees, whether it's through, uh, through matching uh, individuals with, uh, with employers or whether it's to providing some uh, hands-on support in terms of helping them build uh, better HR capacity or putting in place the workplace uh, practices and policies uh, that they need to create truly uh, inclusive work, uh, work, uh, workplaces. Um, and as the strategy document notes, there's also a need, uh, th there is this need for more direct assistance to employees. Um, so we, uh, we, are, we are doing a bit more of that. Uh, in addition to the, uh, the $40 million uh, that is spent annually through the Opportunities Fund, uh, there is a new uh, $18.4 million enhancement that the Parliamentary Secretary spoke about um, yesterday during, uh, during her address uh, at lunch. Uh, and these are, this is specifically geared towards matching persons with disabilities with employers uh, and also doing some more of the hands-on uh, support for employers that, uh, that I uh, spoke about. Um, so, uh, so I guess what would be maybe most helpful for me is to, is to know a little bit more about, uh, about your experiences and, uh, and what you've done in terms of creating those inclusive workplaces and in, and, and in terms of, of creating those, uh, those matchmaking services. So maybe I'll just uh, uh, leave it at that and, uh, and uh, leave some time for, uh, for discussion and questions. <clears throat> Thank you uh, very much, everybody on the panel. We do have time for questions uh, from the floor. Um, and Kathy's got the mic, so Kathy, you've got one right there. If you can say your name, please. I'm just making sure it's on, yeah. Okay. So, hi, I'm Matthew Galena. I'm the National Assets Training Coordinator with the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples. Thank you very much to everybody on the panel for your insight and information. And I'm just asking for your personal, your experiences, what has been your biggest challenge in hiring members of the underrepresented population like Aboriginals in your companies? Does anybody want to take that? I mean, what, was, what, are, what were the challenges? Yeah. Um, haven't had any challenges. Um, are you, I mean, maybe I can maybe I can clarify the question. Are you yeah. are you asking specifically about how they can find and re, find hire and then retain um, yes persons yes um, from, with with an intersectional lens, not just with disabilities, but also um, from other rep, underrepresented groups like Indigenous. Okay, sure. <laughs> Um, so we have a number of people um, that would fit into a number of different minorities working with us right now, whether there be people with disabilities, newcomers. Um, I, you know, I, I spoke on a little bit earlier is that um, stigma, and not only stigma as someone who is going out there and hiring people, like the, but uh, stigma of staff and other individuals within an organization. You know, making sure that you you go through your organization and say, hey, here's here's a new person working on your team treat them like anyone else and work with them like anyone else because you know everybody everybody has their own biases that you do have to break down um, to make sure that everybody can work together and, and work efficiently um, outside of that I'd say for um, for actually going out and finding those people that that's an issue and I know that's something that I I kind of I, I lack on you know when I when I post a, a job posting up on indeed there's probably a lot of people that just don't see that and don't have the access to actually come out to it. So it's with the help from folks like the CCRW that actually get us uh, access to that, that labor pool. Um, because I know I do, like I said, um, and I, I'm working more and more to, to reach out to more agencies to allow us to diversify our labor force. But um, definitely at, at first, I was, I take whoever comes in the door. And a lot of times, you know, that, that means I haven't really offered um, a job up to the entire community. 
Thank you. Is there another question? Uh, Kathy, over here. You need a microphone. Sorry. Right. Kathy? No. Mm -hmm. Sorry. We have, we have French translation. We have accessibility issues. So we need a microphone. Here, Kathy's got it. Thank you. No, thank you so much for your comments. I'm just wondering if you tried friendship centers at all instead of Indeed, because uh, people, you know, with technology, that might be a barrier to employment. I haven't, no. Yeah, and thank you, Keegan, for helping me out there before, because um, I agree with all that. Um, but sorry, the f friendship centers, is that, is that, I have not, and I appreciate you letting me know that, because I will uh, definitely check on that, because uh, that's, you know, job boards and Indeed and, you know, and all that sort of stuff is generally what we do, again, because we're a small company and I'm doing everything from, you know, handling machinery to, you know, hiring people to, uh, you know, everything, you know, um, so I, you don't have a lot of time to, to embark on all that kind of stuff. So, um, so anyway, so I will check because I'm sure in Port of Superior, which is uh, half an hour um, west of us, and then of course in inside of uh, Winnipeg, um, with, that's that's a fantastic idea. So, thank you. I think we have another question over here. Yeah. Yep. Hi, Susan Gazarowski with NSERC and Shirk with the, the Government of Canada. Um, this is more a question, I would guess, to well, to all the panelists, but mostly to Jamie and possibly um, Todd. Um, Jamie, you said something that that resonated, and and it's that moment of opportunity that that moment of, of opportunity is right now, um, and maybe not so much thinking of my current employer, but thinking of those larger employers in manufacturing who are so business driven and so numbers driven. How do we make them realize that this is that moment of opportunity? That there is benefits there. H how do we sell that? Uh, you actually answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> it is business driven. Um, there is, businesses are looking for talent, period. I mean, that is the point. And if you provide them with a full solution that incorporates the question from the gentleman on the floor of how are you searching for talent, a small business is very challenged by process because they're doing everything they can to keep their business going. Um, big business has the manpower to be able to facilitate those processes in order to attract. So they're looking, currently right now, I'll give you an example, um, eight years running in Dolphin Disabilities Mentoring Day, manufacturing has only participated in the last two years. So if you look at where your labor market increases are, and if you look at where the decreases are, and yet there's still hiring going on, you begin to see a pattern of, of uh, social economic factors factors in certain, certain geographical locations, and you can start to pinpoint those. If you walk through the door of a business and you understand their challenges, and you can bring them a full solution, trust me, you won't have to sell them on anything. <laughs> Thank you. We have another question. Hi there, yes, thank you very much for the comments of this panel. It's been uh, really enlightening. And uh, I'm just wondering where you've been all my life. <laughs> um, I work, uh, I'm a coalition for persons, uh, I'm from the uh, Coalitions for Persons with Disabilities uh, in Mississauga, Ontario. Uh, my name is David. And uh, I've, it's been, uh, I've really enjoyed the inspiring stories that you have offered today and um, seeing that there is an untapped group of employers with the disability community and I think that is really wonderful that, that you're aware that that community is out there. In terms of um, transitioning clients with managers, that's I feel where a lot of the um, the miscommunication can happen, and there needs to be um, there needs to be some follow up once an individual with disabilities has been hired, so that uh, the transition is going well, because that is where um, a lot of the um, retention problems happen. Is that uh, once they've been hired, they don't have continuing support afterwards. So um, I'm also. Uh, and, I, and I'm also wondering uh, if, if an individual has been hired in, in an environment and they don't necessarily feel safe in that environment anymore, they, is there opportunity to be, um, is there opportunity for them room to grow within the company uh, so they don't feel stagnated in the job that they've been hired for? 
Or, or is it, or are the people with disability that are being hired, are they are just the tokenism of, um, uh, of having to make the workplace more inclusive? Thank you. If I can, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, I believe if I have this, have this right, um, is, is basically the growth um, within the company, which I, I believe that I, I touched upon a little bit. Um, in the case um, of Reed, <laughs> for, for us, uh, he can have my job. Uh, he's, um, you know, as, as he grows there, we unfortunately don't have a lot of, um, like we literally have people that work on the saws, forklift operators, and well, and I mean, then there's a couple of uh, line people, but there, there isn't very, very much. They're more than welcome to, should those jobs available, uh, you know, and they're capable of doing them, absolutely. Um, but, you know, as I've gone through this process, and this is all very new to me, um, you know, hey, if, they, if we can get them any types of skills that they need to, to carry on and go into another, uh, another field, another, another company, as long as it's not the competition, I guess, um, then, uh, you know, more than welcome to, uh, to help them out, so. Um, and then as far as, you know, it, it, when at the, at the beginning you said the awareness, and, and uh, I think we're all becoming more and more aware, but it's, uh, you know, I think a lot of us aren't there yet. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe also you can comment on, and I know, Jamie, you've had, had some experience with this as well, about David's question around um, when, uh, when they're placed with you, but it's not working out. And especially specific to people with disabilities, why, uh, why in your opinion, it's not working out? And, and, and what that disconnect is to make sure that, the, that, that, that employment is successful. Well, I was looking at Jamie because I know she's got some experience with it, but um, my other best friends can answer too. I think it was Keegan that mentioned that you have to be able to do the job. It's important that we deliver customer satisfaction. So that is always going to be the lens with which we do um, anything. Um, from our perspective, I'm often asked, you know, how do you ha fire someone with a disability? <laughs> Same way you fire anyone else. I hope that you all have an understanding of that. And it's the tough conversations that this strategy is going to inspire that really will move the needle. Um, I, I think that any business is challenged with figuring out change. We did um, a core strategy review last week where we were reviewing scenarios as what if your outputs change? So Dolphin, when it started, was 95% support services. We are zero today. So if that much change has happened, how have we nurtured those who work with us to be able to continue their work? Some have left. I celebrate that because it means that we gave them what they needed at a time they needed it to move forward and they gave us what we needed for our clients. I don't think that it should be looked at as a negative and if there is a challenge with any employee, it should look exactly the same how you manage it. It might be, and, and I appreciate you sharing because this is new to you, but your perspective is inspiring because you're honest, you're out there with what you've done. And we need to hear those stories because it is uncomfortable when you don't know. But if we don't talk about it, we won't figure it out. And that's the truth. So it's by evaluating what we do right analyzing it, making it better. It's that deep collaboration that I was talking about that is most important. So we can go to businesses that are doing this, that are hiring, that have had challenges, had successes, talk about it, share, and build on each other's success. Yeah, just one point I'd like to make. Oh, right there. Um, is that for us, I find that um, accommodations becomes policy. So at first, where it's, we're, we're, we're learning that, oh, this is how we can help this individual, especially, you know, that ongoing support after hire. In reality, we find that, no, this isn't, this isn't accommodation for a person with, an individual with a disability in the workplace. This is what our policy should be for all of our staff. So that's, that's really where, you know, being an employer, this is so important for us and, and can be so beneficial from us outside of the financial sense because we've just made a more inclusive and supportive workplace for all of our staff just by you know, having, having someone who's kind of challenged us to, to change our norms. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Anne? 
Hi. Um, I'm just wondering um, if any of you have had any experience as small business uh, operators with job carving, where an individual might not be able to do the whole job, but could do a portion of the job. So it could be something that um, if you could hive it off, then the individuals who are doing the whole job could be leveraged to, to work on certain aspects of it, and some of that work could be done by somebody else. So I'm just wondering if you've had any experience with that and if it, if it can work in a, in a small business environment. Anybody? Yes, uh, <laughs> this is a simple answer. Um, but in reality, we, we've done that with um, individuals re-entering the workplace when they've come from uh, things like um, workers' compensation and when they have to re-enter the workplace on uh, the, the kind of the exact term is escaping me right now, but on, on modified duty work. So there, there's lots of that to be able to, you know, incorporate someone into the workplace that can't do, uh, isn't capable for some reason to do the, the entirety of a job, but can have modified uh, duties to still have meaningful work within uh, our organization and, yeah, and be there being helpful. I think it's really important for the times. I mentioned the gig economy. I mean, this is going to be how work is um, transpires. And for all of us to work together to figure that process out and what does that look like, uh, I'm, I'm challenged with the word job carving. To me, it's a job. And if the opportunity is that I can have the best person for that job, but they are telling me that they can only work mornings, um, I've hired that person. She was our first employee. She was the best employee I probably will ever have because I had her at her best every single day, <laughs> and the rest was easy. Good. And I was just going to say that we, we pretty much do that with, uh, with all of our staff and that, um, you know, because uh, we have a variety of different saws and, and um, different positions with, within the plant floor. Um, and so the, you know, so that's, that's very easy as far as uh, maneuvering them to, to where, they can, where they can work. Um, I, th I think our biggest challenge right now, and, and I know that we've touched um, on this in other panels, et cetera, and we'd, at my table there, we, we had kind of discussed it, um, is basically um, time off challenges. I think that's probably the, the, the hardest one, um, you know, because you can make accommodations, but you can only make accommodations for, for, for so much because you still have to show up for work, et cetera. We haven't really had that problem, a couple of, couple of folks that we've had, but um, I would say that's probably a bigger challenge than, than actually maneuvering them because basically all it is is just it's training and just making sure that um, if they can't do that job, then you know, well, let's, let's work on something else until they can actually do, do that job or find somebody else that can do it and they can continue doing it. You know. Excellent. Are there any other questions? Oh, uh, so we, we, we probably have time for two more. So there's one over here, and then I see I saw Shelley's hand as well. Hi, my name is Siobhan Fleury. I work at Employment and Social Development Canada. Um, I have a question about the issue of wage subsidies. Um, some, there's some um, controversy around wage subsidies and the idea that once the subsidy is over, um, the person with a disability might not retain their job. Um, I found it really interesting that, Peter, you, you brought up the utility of wage, a wage subsidy in your circumstance, and I wondered if you or other members of the panel might be able to elaborate on that. I'll protect you. <laughs> I'm going to protect no, my employers. It, um, as, I, as I've stated, I mean, uh, so far we've, we've only had Reed, but um, it's, it, it, again, he, he wouldn't have lasted and I, 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 because um, we, our f people are on, a, on the floor. They're pretty gruff people and, and uh, um, you know, love them, but, uh, you know, they, they're, they're not easy to get along with sometimes, and I'm not easy to get along with sometimes, but um, so, you know, it... it it just, it really, really helped us, again, just to go through that, you know, again, not just training Reed, but, but training ourselves as well. Um, so, I mean, I guess you could, you could see that situation, but, I mean, Reed's been with us for two years now, and, and so it just got us, got us both to start. So, um, I, I don't know, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. I think that if there's a job without the wage subsidy, 
then the wage subsidy works. But if there's no job and there's not going to be a job, come on. I, I actually wrote down a note that I didn't say earlier um, before that was, because uh, I, I didn't want to ruin it for the rest of the business community, but I, I wrote down the idea that funding uh, isn't a necessity, at least not for me. It's having someone who, who is going to be a good employee for our organization, that's, that's a financial benefit right there. Um, so the, the funding, I think the funding is going to be very helpful. It's helpful for people who aren't already doing these processes. They don't, and they, you know, to, as the introduction to get them in there. But I've, I've hired, I've, I've hired the last two people I've hired with disabilities I didn't have any subsidies for. And they've been excellent employees and I would never, you know, say I'm not going to hire you because I can't get money for you. I, but, um, yeah, a, a good employee's worth. Yep. Thank you. And just so you know that uh, uh, I know that Emil and I are working on a project on research for wage subsidies specifically for people with disabilities. So it's uh, it is a timely it's a timely topic. And Rebecca, sorry, and Rebecca, of course, and Rebecca. I'm sorry, I just saw Emil. And we've got one last question, Shelley. Uh, Shelley Andrews from Avalon Employment in St. John's, Newfoundland. As a service provider, uh, one of the big challenges that we find with individuals that we support is the application process of applying for positions. That we, are, we know that the individual possibly has the skills that they need, but the process becomes very tedious. And uh, without sometimes a navigator or service provider to help them through that process, they probably would never get through the door. So is there some advice that you can give uh, to service providers or for individuals that do not avail of a service provider that uh, could go through that application process? I think uh, one of the uh, first things that I'd say is, uh, is focusing in on the job and what they can do. Um, and that's pretty, pretty much about it. it. And how it's going to, to benefit the company to, to have this employee on. Um, the rest just handles itself. Because um, once you see that fit, and, and um, then okay, now we can talk about any, any issues that we might have or, uh, or, or need, et cetera. Um, you know, I mean, with Reed's parents, uh, like, you know, they kind of went through, they researched us a little bit, and, you know, he phoned me. He didn't say anything about, like I said, I, I just thought it was just some guy looking for his kid, probably wanted him to get it out of the house or whatever. And so then, but they were doing the research on us, and, and you know, um, and so once they, they found out, you know, and then they came down, then it was, then it was easy, because, yeah, you can do the job. But that's, the, that's what I would say is the focus, focus is on, because if you come in straight in and just say, well, I can't do this, and I can't do this, now, now I, okay, now I'm getting, getting nervous about this. Does that I, I answer your question? One of the best things about small business is that we're very flexible. And so we're different than enterprise. Um, you know, we have the ability to adapt to requests that come in, and it is about having the skills to be able to do the job. Um, in our experience, you know, Dolphin has never used resumes to hire someone. It's been about uh, we created a virtual space to allow them to demonstrate the capabilities that they had, which proved to be very successful. Um, we then used that as the launch pad for um, Disabilities Mentoring Day so that we would be able to ensure that we were matching skill sets to the opportunity presented by the mentors. Um, and within that, we've found businesses that have participated that have demonstrated to us that they are thinking differently. Um, you know, I can think of at least five different businesses that I've worked with that are no longer doing the typical, you know, submit your application. It's so you want to hang out for a bit. Or it's, what do you want to do? Do you want to chat? Do you want to text? Do you want to, you know, there's options. Because the realization is, is that the more variables, the better chances that you're going to be inclusive in your approach to finding that talent. And that's how important finding the right talent has become. Is it done? Absolutely not. Are there methodologies that have not been shared out, that are proven, tried, tested, and true? For certain. And that's why this strategy is going to be such a great thing, because it is working together to, to forecast, to be proactive, and to work together to design those things and bring them forward when they're working that business is going to benefit from. And then, of course, all of the people looking for work will benefit from as well. Excellent. As a service provider, too, I would say, um, 
get out there and target the employers that you're, you're, you're looking to, to work with and, and, and meet with them. I mean, a year ago, I'd, maybe a little over a year ago now, I didn't know who CCRW was. But, you know, I've, you know, when they came in and sat down with me, now my, my hiring process has changed that before a job goes to, to market for me, I, I send them the first message to say, do you have available candidates for me? And that's, it's the same with, and actually I have a number now of, of agencies that I work with in St. John, and that's kind of my, my process, is to go to them first because they're, they're trusted suppliers of people in the workforce for me. Um, so yeah, yeah get, getting out there and really contact them because you will, you know, you'll have to break down a little bit of stigma with, with new businesses that have, have never worked with people with disability before. So it's important to just get out there, get in front of them, and kind of explain to them what you're, what you're trying to do and, and the benefit you're going to be. Thank you. So I think that that's it. Uh, uh, we, I, I want to thank you so very, very much for your time and for your honesty.